Welcome to the bonus session, So You're Getting Married Again, featuring Dr. H. Norm Wright, best-selling author. But before we join Dr. Wright, we're going to introduce you to our friends Greg and Carolyn Vaughn, and they have got a great story for you, and it's going to encourage you. So let me get this straight, folks. You blended seven children in a marriage, a second marriage, and Barb, this story is terrific. It is terrific. Greg, I'm going to ask you first, what were you considering before you and Carolyn married almost 20 years ago? What was I considering? I was considering never marrying again. I mean, let's face it, I had four kids. The last thing I was had on my mind was marriage. Uh, I also was thinking and considering a lot of the pain that I'd been through. I mean, there was seriousness about ever marrying because it had been such a struggle uh, moving through those years of difficulty and pain. So I had a mixture of emotions, like, like a salad that was just all jumbled up in there and then I meet Carolyn. Carolyn, what were you considering after you met Greg and the possibility of remarriage? Well, Barbara, everyone knows that I'm a list maker. My family can tell you that. And I began to make a list of the things that I wanted in a man if I was to ever consider remarrying again. What was on that list? Every woman listening is dying to know. Well, at the top of the list, of course, I wanted um, a man to be passionately in love with Jesus and have a godly character. And second on the list was because I had three children, I wanted um, a man that was not just a good father, but a great father, because I wanted him to love my children in the same way that he loved his own. The next thing on the list that I had was um, I wanted to be able to talk to people who knew him, that I could check this man out. And thank goodness that Dr. Gene Getz was able to do that for me. And uh, the last thing on the list was I wanted somebody tall, dark, handsome, and rich. <laughs> no, not really. But I did get the handsome part. <laughs> you didn't get the rich, I'll tell you that. You know, I love this because you guys met at church. You checked out each other's references. I mean, I love that. But you started to date with seven children. Mm. I mean, unpack that for us because we have so many families that are, are anticipating marriage or getting married, and they're trying to figure out how do you do it with the kids? Gary, I knew that uh, that was, uh, was going to really be the issue. Carol and I were falling in love, but how do you put kids together and blend a family? And I determined early on that we were going to date as a family. Uh, we went everywhere. We would divide my house in half, and her kids would take one half and mine the other. And the more we were in the pool and in the hot tub and running around the house just acting dumb, something magic happened. We fell in love. God gave us a gift, Gary. The gift from God was that our kids loved one another. Yeah, and that is remarkable. And you shared with us privately that you made the decision that unless all seven of your collective kids gave you the thumbs up, if one of them said no, you would not marry. Now share that with our friends. Well, I had to hold Carolyn's hand a number of times and uh, uh, because it was a sense of conviction. And I knew, I'd seen too many marriages ruined, second marriages ruined because the kids were at war. And I said, can we trust God enough for this, that God would give us the blessing from our kids? And you know, guys, one by one, the kids would begin to come. And it's, hey, Dad, you're getting old, man. You're not going to find anyone better than Carolyn. And the same thing began happening in Carolyn's kids. So tell us about your engagement. Boy, what an adventure that was. Uh, I was building a house, and uh, we were sheetrocking the house, Barbara and Gary, and I had this plan. You know, a film producer always has a plan. So I put tables in the house and put chairs around it and gathered all seven of the children and had a friend of mine think up a, an excuse to bring Carolyn, and there was a video camera present. And her kids were on one side, mine were on the other. And my kids had prepared placards, and so had uh, hers. And when she walked in, they seated her at the head of the table. And then they said, we have a few questions we'd like to ask you guys. And they began to hold up the placard. Will you marry my mom? And then they would run over and then have to shake the card and then we would have to give a yes or no. And then the same thing happened on her side with her kids. And so our children were the ones that asked for our hands in marriage. That is remarkable. And at the end of it, it was really cute. My daughter was a cheerleader and she stood up and she said, two bits, four bits, six bits a dollar, 
all for this marriage. Stand up and holler. Yeah. And there was a roar. I bet. And we popped the non-alcoholic champagne and we celebrated yeah. this new union. Well, I bet you there was not only a roar in that dining room, but there was a roar in heaven uh, mm -hmm. because there was a second chance. And here were two people coming together. And I love this bar because a husband and a wife fallen in love, future husband and a wife. But you know what? All seven of the kids were given thumbs up. Mm. And that's what makes this such a terrific story. It's a great story and there's not a dry eye. Mm. Tell us something. What was your wedding like? Oh, our wedding was, I think, the most beautiful wedding in the world because we had all seven of our children stand up with us. And uh, Gene, as um, he asked us our vows, our children took those same vows and commitment that we would stay together, that they would respect us, and um, it was it was awesome. It was a family partnership. Mm -hmm. How rare it is to hear this. Mm -hmm. Tell us, how would you describe your marriage today? Well, our marriage is exciting and it's wonderful. And um, it, it, there are times where it has been extremely hard and challenging, as you can imagine, with seven children and all the different personalities. And I think if you were to ask all of our children, they would say that it's been fun and exciting and, and wonderful and awesome. Our family has a lot of love. Boy, Gary, isn't that what we all want to hear in our families? You know, it is. And, and Craig, if you would look in the camera and just encourage these precious men and women that are anticipating a second marriage or a subsequent marriage and encourage them. The thing I'd like to say to you is that God wants to be faithful to you in the same way he has been faithful to us. You know, God's a sovereign God. He's in charge of the affairs, the, the bad stuff that happens in our life, as well as the good stuff. And I think if you remain faithful and walk with God and be obedient to Him, that He will restore the years the locust has eaten in your life. Be faithful. Uh, listen. Know this, that the statistics are not good. Uh, they're stacked against you. But we have a God bigger than the bad statistics in second marriages. Be faithful. Look to Him trust him, seek his ways, and he will bless your life. You know, Barb, this is an awesome testimony of a real couple that fell in love. They brought their seven kids together. And you know what? That family is now multiplying as you're seeing your kids married and grandchildren right. coming into your family. And that is the promise for our friends that are considering a second marriage. Let's go now to H. Norm Wright, and he's going to unpack a message that may be years old, but you're going to see it with fresh eyes, a fresh heart, and a fresh spirit. So get out your pen and paper, get ready to take notes, and listen to the master, Dr. H. Norm Wright. Some of you who are watching this video series may be entering into marriage for a second time or even a third time. You've been through a marriage, a divorce has occurred, and now you're wanting to be married again. But I guess the question is, are you ready? Are you really ready for this new marriage? And so that causes me, whenever I'm working with couples in, in my office that have been married before, to raise a number of questions with them. And the first one is, how long has it been since the actual divorce has been over? How long have you been single? Sometimes I hear people saying, well, uh, it's been about uh, six months or three months or two years or three years. And one of the problems is that all too frequently, people who come out of a divorce reconnect way too soon and they bypass the whole recovery process. You know, divorce is really devastating. It is one of the most painful experiences of life because the message in it often is, I don't want you. There's a tremendous amount of rejection that you experience. And you need to go through that process of grieving. You know, when you lose somebody in death, there can be a finality to the grieving. Finality. There's a closure there. But with a divorce, especially if there was children, it goes on and on for years. You're always in some way connected to that former partner. As a man shared with me one time, Norm, when is it ever going to end? It's been 12 years since my divorce, and every time I have the children over for their weekend, when I take them home, back to their mother's house, I grieve all over again. When does it end? 
maybe it doesn't end. My concern is, though, that if you're looking forward to marriage, have you really had an opportunity to confront what went on, to evaluate it, to come to the place where you are now a whole person? Because the new person you're marrying is not going to make you whole. Somebody said years ago, you can't be happily married to another person unless you're happily married to yourself. You really need to feel good about yourself and accepting of yourself. That way you have something to give. One of my other questions would be, have you gone through a complete and thorough divorce recovery program? And when I have couples in my office and they say, well, no, I haven't, I ask them to put the premarital counseling on hold until they have gone through that experience because it's been a very beneficial experience. Sometimes you'll be able to find them in other churches in the community in which you live. But fortunately now, there is a complete program of about 12 to 15 videotapes along with a workbook called Divorce Care that a person can use in their home, they can use it in their church in a small group. And by going through this series, then you have the opportunity to really face the issues and go through the grieving. You see, when you grieve, you have to face your hurt and you have to realize what it is that you've lost. And when you've lost a person in a divorce, it's not just that person. It's a helpmeet, somebody who maybe helped with the errands, helped with the bills, you're in a whole new financial situation, helped with the children, and you're on your own, and you want to make sure that that's behind you and you can be forward-looking. A lot of people are still backward-looking and we want to make sure that you're going ahead and this new marriage has every opportunity to really be the marriage that you've already wanted. So is that former marriage over? Interesting question. A lot of people say, well, of course, we're divorced. No, 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 that's not what I mean. <laughs> is the former marriage really over for you intellectually, emotionally? Have you accepted the death of the prior marriage and have you actually said goodbye to it or is there still an interference? Do you know what we sometimes do? I've asked people to write a goodbye letter to the former marriage and sometimes a goodbye letter to the former partner, not that either of these are mailed, but it's like a symbolic act. It is a step showing that, yes, this is over, and in that letter you express any leftover feelings that are there, and you really say goodbye, and you talk about what goodbye means, and how you are now capable of moving ahead. And I go so far as to ask the individual to sit in a room by themselves, take everything out of it that's alive, I mean, even the goldfish, dog, whatever, and set up an empty chair opposite you. And read that letter aloud as though quote, the marriage or the person might have been there, and drain it out, and then when you're through, just ask God's blessing upon your life, and it's like having a fresh start. That's what it's about, saying, this is the point where I'm now ready to move ahead. The old is really passed away. Oh, I ask couples, individuals, a lot of questions, a lot of questions to consider before they move ahead. In fact, at this point, what I would like you to do is stop the video and turn to your workbook. And some of the questions that you are going to be reading in the workbook are these. I'll just sort of forewarn you about them ahead of time. How long has it been since your previous marriage ended? Who were the support people who, de who you developed to help you through this time? See, people who survive a crisis the best are those who have allowed others to minister to them at this time, to listen to them, to work with you, to pray with you. How do you feel about yourself now as compared to how you felt at the end of your previous marriage? You know, when I ask that in counseling, I've heard people say, I feel like a whole person again. At the end of my first marriage, I was fragmented. I felt like dirt. I just didn't have any worth. It was like my whole life was over. But another important question is, what have you learned since the end of your first marriage? 
How will you be different now? What have you learned from your past marriage that will help you in the new marriage? Such as, what uh, have you learned about your needs, your feelings, your goals, your flexibility, the way you handle stress, the way you handle another person's anger, or the ways in which other people differ from you? And then, what are six ways that you will be a better partner to your new partner than you were before? See, we don't want to get into a situation where there's a lot of blame. Blame keeps us stuck in the past. We really want to be able to move ahead. And in addition to those six questions that you're going to be answering in just a minute, there's another series that deals with how you tried to work through problems in your former marriage. How did you relate to your previous spouse? And then we move into the children area, because if there were children, how did you arrive at the plan of shared parenthood, and how do you feel about this? You know, as we think about going into another marriage, there's certain things to consider, such as, you're going to probably have to share your partner with more people than you realize. If you have two or three children coming into the marriage and your partner has two or three, you don't have time for that, that year of separateness from everything else out there. It's like, boom, you go in immediately and, uh, wow, their three children and my three children, I just hope this really, really works out. And you have to work through all that ahead of time. Hopefully, you have developed a friendship together as a family. And it's so important when you date somebody and you're looking forward to another marriage that you have, in a sense, dated the whole family. You've done family activities because it's asking a lot to bring, you know, three people on one side and three people on the other side to come together and just really work this out. Sometimes a new marriage is meant to punish the old partner or to show that I'm okay. And you put a lot of pressure on yourself to, su to succeed. It's like saying, I'll show them. I'll show them that I can make it. And you know one of the reasons why you would tend to do that? To prove that in the last marriage, the problem or the defect really wasn't with you, but it was them. But your new marriage is not a proving ground. Don't let it be contaminated by what went on before. Oh, well, there's going to be a lot of pressure to succeed at this time. You're going to put pressure on yourself. You're going to have some fears. You're going to wonder, what if? One of the questions that I would ask of you is, how are you going to respond if your new partner, after a while, begins behaving or responding like your old partner did? I can remember asking that of a couple, and the man just got big-eyed like this and shocked and said, she wouldn't dare. But I mean, what if she does? How would you handle it? I never thought that that could ever occur. Yes, but if it does, how will you handle it? And if it does, what might that be saying? Because could it be that in some way we trigger off the other person to respond in a certain way? Actually, if a person is getting married again, the premarital counseling needs to be even more extensive. And if there are children, maybe from seven or eight years of age up, I think it's great to involve them, to bring them in together. I remember working with a couple one time where she was divorced and had two daughters, probably about um, oh, nine and six. And he was an older man. He was a widower who had raised two daughters. They came to see me after five months of courtship, which sounds kind of soon. But then I discovered they had been courting on the average of six hours a day. Half of it with she and the girls and half of it with just the two of them together. And on their first date, they were out and the two girls were in the back seat. And so he's driving along and he says, Judy, I'd like to share with you my testimony of what Jesus Christ means to me. And so for 15 minutes, he just shared. And these two girls are sitting back there listening. And then he said, Judy, I'd like to hear your testimony of what Jesus means to you. So she shared with him. And when she got in the house with her two girls, the oldest girl came up and said, Mom, that was so neat. I'd never heard your testimony before. <laughs> and it was just a choice relationship. It's so one of the few times I had the opportunity to participate in the service, and it uh, was a backyard ceremony, and I vowed that was going to be my one and only backyard ceremony because we were near Orange County Airport. 
And after the little planes came over, the big jets came over, and then the birds came in the tree, and halfway through the ceremony, they dressed up their dorky little dog with a ribbon in its hair, and it came and stood between the bride and groom and my friend and I, and we're all hoping, no, it won't. Go away, go away, dog. And finally, it went away. And it was about 85 degrees, and we're in, in these wool suits. And uh, it was really a joyful occasion. And then for their checkup, they invited Joyce and I over to their house a year later and had dinner for us, because I always like to check up with couples afterwards. And uh, they've been married ever since. They've been through some difficult times. He lost his job. But there was a commitment. And that commitment made it work. And remarriages really can work, even though the divorce rate is higher than the first marriages. And it's just a challenge to us. We're going to do something about it. And any of you who are getting married again, this is one of your challenges to go ahead and make this work. Now, some of the pressures you're going to experience is from other people on the outside, such as, oh, you're Bill's new wife. Well, I certainly hope you know how to handle his kids better than his first wife did. Oh, wow, that's been said. Or the relatives. Oh, okay, I guess we have to get used to um, accepting you as Bill's wife, but we sure did love his first wife, and she's still a part of the family. And I hope you don't mind, dear, but on some occasions she will still be coming over for family get-togethers. It happens. See, sometimes I like to draw out charts showing all the family relationships and who is involved here because it really, um, really gets kind of wild. One of the big questions is to ask as a couple, okay, how involved is the former spouse going to be in this marriage? If there's no children, the chances are very good that you might never see them again. But when there's children, you've got to talk about how often do we call one another? I've had situations where a husband has been spending more time over at the first wife's house with the children than with his new wife and the children there, and he can't understand why his new wife is jealous. I think there's a little bit of a blockage there because your commitment is to this new person. What do you call the former spouse when they call up? How much time do you spend talking? How comfortable are you with how friendly the other person is? I mean, there's all sorts of different questions. In the workbook, there's a whole series of 24 specific questions that I will ask you to go through, answer, and talk about. And you might find some disagreement on this because, you know, this takes more work and more acceptance going through this type of a relationship. As you enter into your new marriage, what are your expectations for this marriage? Are they really realistic or not? Jim Smoke, in his books on remarriage and divorce, came up with a list of some very choice expectations that um, are not particularly um, realistic. My new spouse will make me far happier than my former spouse did. My new spouse will be totally different from my former spouse. Probably not. Isn't it interesting how people have a tendency to gravitate toward the same kind of people? Uh, we've seen this in real problem areas where uh, perhaps a man or woman is married to an alcoholic and they divorce. Second spouse is alcoholic. What happened? Third spouse is alcoholic. Are they drawn toward them? Do they help reinforce this? What? Why do we respond to the people that we do? That's something for you to look at. My new spouse will always understand me. Nobody ever fully <laughs> understands us. Not at all. That's a dream. But see, depending upon the areas of pain in your former relationship and the deficits and the lacks in the former relationship, that tends to make your expectations in that area in this new marriage even higher and can really place a burden or stress upon a new partner. That's why you really need to write these down. Um, in addition to writing down the regular expectations for getting married, there's going to have to be expectations about, quote, the new person as such. Um, my new spouse will have none of the bad habits of my former spouse. Well, I guess you have to clarify what you mean by bad habits. Were they really bad or were they just different? That's something. My new spouse will never disappoint me. Both of you will disappoint one another. That's inevitable. Give it permission to happen. Because if you have these high expectations, how will you think 
how will you respond when they're not met? Will you say, okay, I knew it would happen. You're going to be just like the other person. Or if problems occur in the new marriage, then the old partner starts looking better because of the factor of time differential, distance, and now you're right there facing the pain where the other has become a fading memory. You've got to really give this new relationship a, an opportunity. My new spouse will never handle money as poorly as my former spouse. If that was the problem in the previous marriage, the chances are you're going to be very tight with the purse strings and that could really diminish the effectiveness of your new partner. My new spouse will make me a better person and make me happy. That's interesting. I didn't know that the calling to be married was to have happiness. Does it say that biblically? That we are entitled to happiness? I haven't run into that. There's joy. And joy is an option. There can be satisfaction. But I think we're responsible ourselves to bring satisfaction or happiness into our life. My new spouse will make all the pain and hurt from my previous marriage go away. No, that has to be taken care of well before you even start to connect. Because if you're coming out of a painful background and using the new one to soothe whatever was there, it won't work. And then finally, my new spouse is perfect. As they say in our dreams, <laughs> nobody is ever, ever perfect. And what Jim said in his book, if any of the about-to-be current second marriage spouses knew that these were expectations for them, they would probably leave the country. And that's probably a good idea as well. There's a lot of questions that you will need to consider that are going to be in your, in your workbook. And as you go through a divorce recovery program, you'll have even more that, um, that come up. Now, you realize too, as you've watched this video, you know that we ask you 12 reasons why you want to marry the other person. And you really need to evaluate those. But let me identify some of what we call the bad reasons for a remarriage. One is emotional rescue. I'm so hurting emotionally. I'm so tied up with this pain. I've got to have relief. So I'll marry this person and I'll be taken care of. Or relational rescue. Hey, I'm just tired of being alone. And I go home at night and there's nobody there. So I just like the company of someone. But sometimes that makes us less selective too. We'll just take anybody because a warm body is better than none. Financial rescue. And when you've been plunged into the single lifestyle again, especially if there is children and you've seen your money begin to ooze away and often more so for the women. And they find somebody that can support them financially and in their mind they think, you know, I'm not sure I really love them fully, but they can really take care of me and that's better than nothing. Then there's the sexual rescue where you've been accustomed to having sexual relationships before and now it's no longer there. Then you connect. And then finally, there's the parental rescue. I need somebody to serve as a parent to my children. When you marry somebody, the non-biological parent needs to function as either an aunt or uncle or friend for the first five to six years. It takes that long for them to win the opportunity of coming in and functioning on a parental level. And the biological parent is the one that needs to take care of the discipline because the other is an earned process. I've seen a lot of situations where a woman marries a man who has not had children and he comes in and he becomes a dictator and a controller and she is going to protect her children and those marriages break up just like that. I remember one year I, I saw three or four exactly like that and they were all predictable. Now keep in mind that if, you, if there are children in this kind of a relationship, you court the parent and you befriend the children. And if there's children, there are certain things that need to occur. Number one, you've got to form a foreign policy plan toward the former spouse. You work together as a couple so that you know how to respond, what to do, what not to say, how long to stay on the phone. There are certain things that come up like, uh, 
Okay, what's the name for the new parent? What did your children call the new spouse? Is it additional parent? <laughs> Substitute parent? What? Those are basic things you have to talk about, and a lot of people have never thought about them. How are you going to express love and affection? What about anger? Things like that. What about the discipline conflicts? What if you come in and, boy, oh, I'd never discipline my kids that way. You've got to be reoriented in your discipline philosophy together. might mean you take the time to read some new books together. And you've got to give up some of your own ways, form your new ways for this particular marriage. How are you going to handle the sibling conflicts? How do the kids share the rooms? What do they call one another? What about the competition of time? What about privacy for the children, privacy for you? What if you're a man and you marry someone who has two teenage daughters and you've never had daughters around before? Boy, you really need to talk that through. The whole family needs to talk it through so there is privacy and proper um, boundary uh, observation. How are you going to handle the emotional upset over the visitation? And then what about the financial strain? Say that you're a woman and you marry a man and you realize that a third of his salary goes out every month to support his children from the other marriage. I mean, these are just a few of some of the questions. Now, these types of relationships, yes, they can make it. It takes a lot of prayer, a lot of work, a lot of honesty. I remember when my daughter's best friend was married. We were sitting on the aisle, and it's, here's the music for Here Comes the Bride, and I turned around to look and looked, looked again because here Lauren came down the aisle with her father on the left side and her stepfather on the right side because she had a good relationship with both, and, this, and the stepfather and the father had worked out a healthy relationship, and that worked for them. And you have to learn to be creative, and you have to learn how to get along. And people ask, is it possible to make it in a remarriage? It is definitely possible with an extensive amount of planning and an extensive amount of praying and with the grace of God throughout this relationship.